There was a movie I once watched called The Odd Life of Timothy Green. It's actually a pretty sad story, all things considered, but I just couldn't help but think about the Zatsu as I watched this movie. I mean, a boy that appears to be part plant, appearing because his parents bury a box full of dreams. I mean, that was some real creation of all things technique stuff right there. And it reminded me of when Hagodomo created the tailed beasts out of the tentails. But Hagodomo's utilization of yin yang release took the imaginary and gave it form. His desire to protect the people by splitting the ten tails into nine different beasts gave rise to this split, and the creation of the nine unique personalities simply by willing it so. But anyway, the movie made me think about the ten tails and its ability to generate life, as well as its feral nature, and how Kaguya Otsutsuki had fused with it, and it made me wonder, what if Naruto were the ten tails? Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've also noticed that a lot of the folks who regularly watch our videos aren't actually subscribed to our channel. We get it, YouTube does a great job of getting the right videos to the right people, but if you want to make sure that you don't miss any videos, and if you want to support the Amagi, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much! The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Hashirama Senju stood there in the rain. His perch atop this mountain gave him a view into the distant horizon. Across from him, in what appeared to be a bowl of land surrounded by mountains, a large silhouette loomed. It was large, its true appearance hidden in the overcast night. Only short glimpses were caught of it when the flash of lightning crossed above. Sometimes the lightning would strike it to which it offered no reaction. It was a monster. Looking upon it brought Hashirama to terror, his body shaking. Hashirama! A voice cried out from below. Madara looked up at him, his eyes bearing rings reaching from the center and moving outward, the sclera a purplish hue. He smiled in cruel expectation at the man who had once been his equal and opposite, but no longer. Madara was now a god, and Hashirama was nothing more than a simple man. Come down here, Hashirama, or has it finally hit you that you can't beat me, he asked, his voice mocking, each word a separate insult to Hashirama's pride. Hashirama slid down the mountain and came to meet Madara. He was silent as he looked into the pale purple eyes of the man he once considered his brother. Madara looked back behind him. The legends uttered in silence, orally kept from generation to generation, spoke of the sage's greatest weapon, his source of power, life itself. I thought it to be a myth. Little did I know. I decided to venture about in my exile. During this time, I wandered to the northeast of the land of fire and found our ancestral home, the land of ancestors, or what was left of it. Ravaged, ruined, lifeless, the only thing standing among these sun-baked dunes was a single temple with a powerful seal. Within, I found the beast with the power to give life and take it away. The Ten Tails. Ancient warnings were scrawled across the walls, speaking of the sage and its power. In forming a pact with it, our power was shared, and within me awakened the power of the Sage of Six Paths. The very man we venerate and teach our children of, I and he are now one. I am the God of Destruction, and I've come to judge Konoha for its sins. Hashirama growled as a scowl covered his face. And what sins have we committed, Madara? What sins have we committed? Madara looked down upon him. The sin of dishonesty. We're shinobi, Madara. Dishonesty is our greatest tool. Madara shook his head. No, dishonesty towards yourselves. Your surety that our village will bring an everlasting peace. Failure to take precautions to stop the coming wars. You fooled yourselves, and because of your foolishness, judgment has come. Hashirama refused this, and so their fight began. This is way tougher of a battle here, because Madara now not only possesses the Ten Tails, but he also possesses the Rinnegan that comes with it. Now, I'm no expert at scaling, but I would have to say that I highly doubt Hashirama can do this alone. If Madara in the original canon timeline was considered easy mode, then what Hashirama is facing now is practically Dante must die mode. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna throw Tobirama into this battle as well, because I don't think it's feasible for Hashirama to beat this by himself. I'm even slightly wondering if he can truly beat this threat, even with Tobirama, but you know, if worse comes to worse, a little plot armor never hurt nobody. 
Hashirama, kneeling on the ground, holding himself up by leaning upon his katana, felt hopeless. But that was when a flash of light appeared by him. Tobirama rose to his full height as he stood beside his brother. Hashirama looked at him, still trying to catch his breath. T Tobirama, I told you to stay away. His stoic brother looked down upon him with an equally stoic expression. And now I'm glad I didn't. He helped Hashirama to stand, and from here they continued to battle against Madara and the Tentails. Despite everything Madara had, Tobirama was faster, and Hashirama had ways of countering all of his attacks. This battle continued on without rest for days, and with the continual aid of Tobirama, they managed to wear Madara down, and Hashirama managed to kill him. But the battle was not yet over. There was the Tentails to deal with. Its grasp on wood release was raw and untamed, but still present. Hashirama, utilizing his Sage Art Wood Release, true several thousand hands, managed to push it back a ways away from the village, the battle carving out a new valley into the landscape. As he continued to press the beast back, he began to utilize a new technique. Hokage style, 60 year old technique, he shouted as he weaved hand signs with the speed to impress even Tobirama. Entering society with bliss bringing hands. He pressed his wood golem's hand to the head of the ten tails, but it wasn't quite enough. Hashirama needed more. He jumped to the beast and pressed his hand to its forehead. It retaliated by attempting to stab through his hand with wooden spikes. However, Hashirama just clinched his teeth and bore the pain, realizing he could not stop. The blood of the first Hokage, as well as his chakra, seeped into the beast itself. He forced the technique as hard as he could, and slowly it began to show signs of working. Eventually, the beast almost seemed to wilt. It continued to grow weaker and weaker, and slowly it became a lifeless husk, wasting away in the night air. Tobirama stood above Madara's body and looked down upon it. If what he said was true, then he in actuality became a god, the next sage of six paths. I need to study him. I need to understand where he derived this power, and better yet, figure out how we can apply this to ourselves. Hashirama stood over Madara's body. He was victorious and had defeated the man who presented the greatest challenge to him in his life. He should be proud, but he wasn't. He was sad. Are you okay, Hashirama? His brother asked, noticing the look on his face. Hashirama nodded. Yeah, it's just, Madara truly was my friend. Are you so sure? Tobirama asked. It took him so long just to accept you, and he easily threw you away. And worse, tried to bring down everything you loved. No friend does that. Hashirama thought about it. Maybe things would have changed had he been Hokage instead. Maybe his views would have been different. Or maybe he was right all along. Tobirama put his hands on Hashirama's shoulders. No, he was gaslighting you, making you doubt yourself. Your gut instincts more often than not are correct. People like him make you question that, make you question yourself. Things you know are wrong. They insist that you're wrong for not accepting. They try to make you believe you're insane and that you would agree with them if you were in the right mind. That's a form of abuse, Hashirama. He abused you as his friend and no true friend ever intentionally gaslights their friend like that. You did nothing wrong. Hashirama nodded and looked down at the body again, but still, it's, it's hard. He was my best friend for years, and he just betrayed me like that. What did I ever do to deserve his hatred? Tobirama shook his head. You didn't do a thing. This has nothing to do with you, Hashirama. He was a sociopath, a manipulator. Your friendship was real to you, but not to him. Don't blame yourself. Hashirama smiled. You always know what to say to help me. If I didn't already know better, I would have assumed you to be the older brother. You're so much wiser and more responsible than I. Tobirama shook his head. No, we just have different strengths. You lead with your heart. I lead with my mind. We have our own strengths and weaknesses, but that doesn't mean that I'm in any way better. Trust me, when Konoha needs someone to comfort them in a time of need, they'll turn to you, not me. Hashirama hugged his brother. I'm still going to miss Madara. Tobirama pat his brother's back. Because that's your nature, brother. You're too pure for this world. Hashirama couldn't bear to see Madara's body anymore, so he turned away from it and walked towards the Tentail's husk. He was a little confused. He had not intended to kill the beast. He merely wanted to suppress its chakra enough to put it to sleep. Honestly, his technique was not one designed to kill. It was one designed to pacify. So how did it do this to the beast? Particularly a beast with such a vast well of power such as the Tentail's. Something just didn't add up. He slid down into the crater where the beast was and began to step around it. He placed his hand on the wood and it felt just as lifeless as it looked, like decaying sandpaper. It gave off a unique smell, not too different from a freshly cut pine tree. His hand was no longer bleeding and the wounds had already nearly healed up. 
What were you? He asked the tree as if expecting some answer. He heard a sound, a rustling of wood and mud. He pulled his blade. Who's there? He asked. He began to step a little closer toward where he heard the sound and saw a shadow move. Someone was here. He followed the shadow to a location, a cleft in the beast's wooden flesh. He heard something from inside of it. He reached out and gripped the wood and pulled it away and pointed his blade at the first thing he saw. To his surprise, he saw a small child, dirty, shivering, and the look of terror present in its eyes. Hashirama lowered his blade as Tobirama came to see what was going on, his blade present in his hands. What is that thing? He asked. Hashirama looked at it. It gives off the same massive chakra signature as the Tentails. I was wondering why the Tentails would die by me simply trying to pacify it. It's because it didn't die, it became this. Tobirama readied his kunai. If it became this thing, then it's vulnerable. Let's kill it. Hashirama put his hand out to stop his brother. No, put the blade away. Hashirama returned his own blade to its saya and knelt down to offer a hand. Tobirama looked at him. Are you crazy? Hashirama looked up. You just got through telling me that I should follow my gut and keep being me. Tobirama shook his head. I said that to keep you from being manipulated by the enemy, not to take a world-shattering weapon of mass destruction and turn it into your best friend. Hashirama edged closer, but the child recoiled, its breathing intensifying. Poor thing. It's terrified. Tobirama scoffed. For easily the strongest creature in the world, it's awfully fearful. Hashirama retracted his hand and put on the kindest face he could. Hello. Don't be scared. I don't want to hurt you. He formed a flower from the ground with his wood release and picked it, offering it to the small child. It appeared to be no older than four. In actuality, it was likely far older by way of the ten tails, but it currently held the form of what its mental state currently was, and Hashirama couldn't bring himself to ignore it. The child took the flower from him and looked at it for a moment before eating it. Both Hashirama and Tobirama were surprised to see this reaction, but to each their own, I suppose. Hashirama came a bit closer and extended his hand to the child. Once more, it recoiled in fear, but Hashirama didn't stop. He stroked its cheek with his hand. The child turned to look toward him. The way he stroked its cheek showed all the loving kindness that a father should have, and that's exactly what he was. Hashirama was no stranger to fatherhood. He had already raised up one child and seen them off. They had even presented him with a grandchild of his own, Tsunade, and he was spoiling her rotten. So he was pretty good with children and this same affection was coming in clutch right now as the Ten Tails' toddler-like incarnation seemed to be soothed by this act. It crawled over to him and embraced him, cowering in his chest like any scared child would. He lifted the beast up into his arms and took the cloak he had brought with him and covered the child with it. You can't be serious. You mean to bring that thing back to Konoha with you? You'll finish what Madara started. Hashirama looked at his brother. I can't leave it alone to fend for itself. And besides, if we can befriend it, we may never need to fight in a war again. This child could be the key to world peace. I refuse to simply ignore that. To that, Tobirama relented. They made their way back to Konoha, where Hashirama and Tobirama would split off. Hashirama was planning to take it to its home, where he and his wife Mito would look after it. He knocked on the door, opened it, and called out for his wife. Mito came downstairs to see it. What are you doing with that child? She asked. Hashirama began to explain it to her. He let the child back down to the ground. It stood there and took his hand, hiding something from Mito. The Uzumaki woman's heart immediately melted upon seeing this and took it as a personal challenge to befriend the tot. She knelt down. It's okay. I won't hurt you. Her hand reached out and wiped away a single tear that was running down its cheek. This act of motherly affection awakened within the toddler an interest to understand her. The child let go of Hashirama's hand and walked to her. Its skin was pale, like tofu, and its skin sort of felt like tofu, too. It's a boy, yes? She asked. Hashirama nodded. She looked at the boy. Has he given you his name yet? Hashirama shook his head. I don't think he has one. Mito smiled. We'll have to change that now, won't we? Hashirama smiled, too. I actually had the perfect name for him. I wanted to name him Kiko, spelled with the characters for wood and child. Makes sense, right? Mito looked at the child and noticed that upon its stomach, it had a red swirling pattern. Nope. I think he looks like a Naruto. Hashirama's brow furrowed in confusion. See the little red swirl on his tummy? His pale color in this red swirl makes him look almost exactly like a fish cake, so his name should be Naruto. Hashirama raised a finger to protest, but the moment Mito cut her eyes to him, he lowered it, deciding to accept the somewhat silly name. She smiled at her defeated husband. Naruto it is then. Mito lifted the child up to dote upon it further, something she hadn't been able to do since her own son had left home some years before. She would clean the child, feed the child, and carry it around on her hip. 
Naruto seemed to be enjoying himself, but he still hadn't spoken yet. I wonder if he's still nervous, Hashirama asked. He came to the child and playfully poked it in the ribs to make it giggle. Ticklish. He continued to tickle the child until it laughed so hard its face took on a reddish color. Hashirama stopped. Can you talk? He asked it. Naruto just looked at him in confusion as Mito sat down with the child on her lap. It didn't respond to him. Can you say anything? It continued to look at him. Mito then spoke. Can you say Hashirama? She asked. The child sat there for a moment. Ah, ha, Hashira. He smiled. Almost there. Naruto continued to try. Suddenly, he shouted it. Hashirama! This took Hashirama by surprise because the way he said it sounded so much like Madara. The child almost seemed worked up when it screamed that name. It buried its head into Mito's bosom, apparently suddenly startled by itself. She looked up at her husband. Didn't you say that it used to be the Ten Tails? Hashirama nodded. Mito looked closer at the child. Perhaps it remembers its time as the Ten Tails. Hashirama thought about it. I certainly hope not. I didn't go easy on it. She began to comfort the boy. Little fella's shaking. Hashirama gave a bit of a laugh. Yeah, me too. He was so strong, I barely escaped with my life. Mito smiled at her husband and then handed the boy over to him to hold for himself. Hashirama held it close to him. By now, his armor was off and he was merely wearing his house kimono. The child seemed to let go of the tension in its body as it heard the beating of Hashirama's heart. It seemed that Hashirama was going to be a father again. He looked down at it with a smile. We're going to need to get him better clothes. I don't think Tajirama's clothes are going to work for him. He's too small for them. Mito agreed. And so, as time passed, Naruto continued to live with Hashirama and Mito. They attempted to educate him. They tried to teach him how to speak English or Japanese or whatever language they speak in the Naruto world, and slowly he would begin to pick it up. His rate of learning was fairly impressive. They hardly had to teach him anything when it came to reading. He merely looked at the paper and read it out loud as if it were the easiest thing in the world. How or why he could do this was unknown to them, but he quickly picked it up. That wasn't to say he talked all that much. He was generally quiet, but he did at least understand what they were saying. So that was a plus. They would tell him stories. Hashirama always hated history lessons, but learned early on if you told history like a story, it would be accepted by children who thought of it as something fun. He tiptoed around certain historical events, such as the Warring States period and the era of the Sage of Six Paths. After all, this boy was technically alive during the Sage's time, and he likely experienced traumatic events that he didn't wish to remember, so they avoided the subject altogether. However, he did teach him about the Warring States period, just avoiding any graphic descriptions of death. Naruto's fire to learn was nothing short of genius and was characterized by his true age, which was technically beyond Hashirama by a millennium. It was then that Hashirama and Mito began to discuss what would come next in their new child's education, and it was decided that he should attend the new school that Tobirama had created. Tobirama had always been a bit of a scholar, believing that there were too many secrets in the world to be discovered by any person during a single lifetime. It was true that Konoha would soon need a military force, and raising up children to be the next generation of shinobi was important. But Tobirama's own dream he had secretly pursued since the foundation of Konoha was to become a teacher. And this dream was finally fulfilled as he had become the schoolmaster of this new academy, essentially the principal of the establishment. Naruto, by this time, was learning just how malleable his flesh truly was, and was capable of changing his appearance into anything he desired. Despite this, Hashirama said that he should be true to who he was. This caused Naruto to not change much about his appearance, electing to merely take on a peachy skin color to match that of his parents. From there, they sent Naruto off to the academy, which wasn't too far from Hashirama's office. So Naruto would always know that if he ever needed his daddy, he was just a few doors down, likely chilling and drinking some iced tea with Tobirama on the Hokage Monument. Naruto's first day of class was like any child's, full of nervousness and worry. What if the other kids don't like me? Or what if the teachers are mean? Or what if I can't understand and fail? Or even will I be okay without mama there? These were the thoughts every child might have on their first day of school, and Naruto was no exception. The look of sheer terror on his face drew attention. When it was time to be dropped off, Mito had a hard time pulling herself away because Naruto was too busy crying into her sleeve, begging her to stay with him. While this school was designed to turn children into shinobi, that didn't mean that the teachers didn't understand. Hashirama and Tobirama both had explained how they wanted this to go. They merely wished for the teachers to do their jobs and teach children everything to turn them into adults, as well as give them a basic grasp of ninjutsu. The things anybody could use. 
Whether the kids wanted to be ninja or not was up to them. The academy was merely there to provide the necessary tools. This was exactly how it should be, the founding brothers thought. After all, their original goal of creating this village was formed after the deaths of so many of their friends and brothers at a very young age. No child should ever be forced to fight and die on a battlefield. If such a war should happen, it ought to be the men, the adults who fight, not those who had yet to even experience life. And perhaps that's where Madara and Hashirama's own ideals had met. At some point, Hashirama believed that Madara had lost his way, but deep down, likely still believed in the concepts they had used to forge the village. Mito would kiss the boy's cheeks and wipe away his tears. It's okay, Naruto. It's gonna be fun. You'll make so many new friends to play with, and the teachers are all really nice. I know many of them. And you won't be alone. Daddy's just down the hall. Naruto sniffled. But I don't want you to leave, Mama. She pushed his hair back over his ears and wiped the tears from his cheeks. A part of her was relieved that he was crying. Tajirama hadn't cried a single tear when he went to school for the first time. He was pleased to be by himself. And while it hurt her to see Naruto so terrified, she was just glad to be needed. I'll tell you what. How about I walk you inside, help you find a place to sit, and introduce you to your teacher? Does that sound good? Naruto nodded. She hugged him to help him slow his sniffling. She then took out a hanky and wiped away his tears and let him blow his nose. She took his hand and began to walk with him into the building to the room where the children his age would gather to learn. Inside was a strong man with a tough build and large beard. Yet, for his intimidating stature, his face and eyes spoke of a kind heart that wanted to serve his community's young and lead them down the right path. Mito walked up. The man offered a slight bow. Lady Mito, it's an honor to see you again. She smiled. It's a pleasure indeed, Rao. I just came to drop off Naruto. The large and imposing man lowered to one knee to greet the small boy. He's adorable. I didn't know that you and Lord Hashirama had produced a second child. Mito smiled. Well, we hadn't planned anything, but this tiny fella found his way to our doorstep and we couldn't turn him away. We may not have decided to have any more kids, but it seemed God had another plan for us. Little blessings. The man looked to Naruto. He offered his hand. Hello, Naruto. I'm Rao, he said in a tone that was light and inviting. Would you like to be in my class? It'll be so much fun and you'll learn so many cool things. Why, I bet you'll surprise your parents with how smart you are when I teach you about the world. Will you join us? Naruto was terrified by his beard, but intrigued all the same. He looked up at Mito, who smiled at him. Naruto walked forward cautiously and took Rao's hand. Rao smiled. Wow, not only are you smart, but you're brave too. Come, I'll show you a place to sit. If you can keep a secret, it's the best place to sit. My favorite spot. He raised a finger to his mouth as if asking Naruto to keep a secret. He began to lead Naruto away. Mito watched as he went and felt that he would be okay. She would then go to Hashirama to spend a little time with him before heading home to get to work on her everyday duties. Rao led Naruto up to the steps where he was allowed to take a seat. He sat down and Rao helped him get what he would need from his backpack and set it on the desk. He would ruffle Naruto's hair. If you need me for anything, I'll just be down the steps of my desk, okay? Naruto nodded. He sat there and watched Rao return to his desk. Naruto sat there silently for a time and had yet to notice that there was a boy sitting next to him already. He looked over and saw the boy writing something out. It looked like letters? No, he was making a design out of it and these letters didn't look like anything Naruto had ever seen. The boy finished what he was writing and looked at the paper and nodded. He then turned to Naruto and sat the paper in front of him and smiled. Naruto looked at it curiously, unable to understand it. The boy would suddenly touch the seals on the paper, and from the paper, a pop of confetti appeared. At first, this startled Naruto, and then it made him laugh. Naruto was astonished by this cool trick. How did you do that? He asked the boy. The boy shrugged. It's just a simple summoning jutsu. My daddy taught me. Naruto looked at it and poked it again. The boy giggled awkwardly. Sorry, it only works once. Naruto smiled. Can I keep this? He asked, looking at the paper. I want to try it myself when I get home. The boy nodded. It's yours. Consider it a welcoming gift. Naruto placed it in his bag. He then turned to face the boy. Hi, I'm Naruto. Naruto Senju. The boy smiled. It's a pleasure to meet you, Naruto. My name is Hiruzen. Hiruzen Sarutobi. And the sourpuss behind me with a scar on his chin is my rival, Donzo. Don't call me a sourpuss, the other boy said. Naruto waved. Donzo looked over at him out of the corner of his eyes for a moment and then looked back at his paper. It seemed he was trying to do the same thing that Hiruzen was doing. He too was writing a formula on a piece of paper. Hiruzen looked over at him. Um, Donzo, you might want to change this character here. Donzo covered his paper with his whole torso. Stop! I can do it too! I know what I'm doing! Naruto continued to watch. Hiruzen stood from his seat and slightly pulled Naruto's chair back a bit. Donzo would finish his own seal. 
he would tap his piece of paper and suddenly it would explode in his face. Donzo would sit there, his face covered in soot. Hiruzen would speak. I tried to tell you, you mixed up the kanji for confetti and explosion. You just made a paper bomb, not something you give to the new kid. Danzo looked like he was about to throw a tantrum, but before he could, Rao was already standing in front of him, arms crossed and toe tapping. Danzo looked up at Rao for a moment before pointing away from himself. Hiruzen made me do it! Rao looked over at Hiruzen. All I did was give my friend a confetti tag. Rao squeezed his tear ducts. How many times do I have to tell you boys not to practice new jutsu in homeroom? We have a whole class for it. Hiruzen and Danzo both stood there and offered a slight bow. We're sorry, Sensei, they both said in unison. Rao sighed. Given that it was an attempt to welcome our new friend, I won't pass down any punishments. But this is the last time, do you understand? Each boy bowed their head again. We understand, Sensei. Rao turned and began to go back down the stairs to his desk. Hiruzen and Donzo sat back down. Hiruzen looked at Donzo out of the corner of his eye with a slight smile and elbowed him with a giggle. Donzo couldn't hide his own smirk no matter how much he wanted to. Hiruzen handed him a towel. Here you go. Donzo took it. Thanks. He began to rub the soot from his face. Naruto clapped. I thought the explosion was pretty cool, Donzo. Donzo's smirk turned into a grin. Thanks. Together, the boys enjoyed their classes. After a time, Naruto had completely forgotten that his mother wasn't there. He remembered it only when his mother came to pick him up from school. She took him home alongside Hashirama. So, who are those boys you were walking with, she asked. Oh, that was Hiruzen and Donzo. They're my new friends. Hashirama thought for a moment. Oh, wait. You mean Sarutobi and Shimura? Naruto nodded. He knelt down to Naruto. You have good taste in friends. Their daddies are my friends, too. They're on the council that helps me make the village safe. Mito giggled a little. That's not likely a coincidence. Rao likely set them up to be friends because of their connection to you. Hashirama nodded. Those boys have a bit of talent. Hiruzen especially. But Danzo's sheer need to surpass Hiruzen will likely spur them to go even further. I see them becoming strong shinobi, like their fathers. I can't tell you how many times my keister has been pulled out of the flames by the Sarutobi and Shimura clan's ten braves. Maybe one day Naruto will want to be a shinobi too. And if he is, I bet he'll be the strongest shinobi ever. Mito looked to Naruto. Do you want to be a ninja, Naruto? Naruto nodded. I want to learn how to make paper bombs like Hiruzen and Danzo can. Hashirama laughed at this. I bet you'll learn that and more when you become a ninja. And together they went home where they would have dinner, clean up, and spend the rest of the day resting. Naruto sat by Mito and Hashirama. He was trying to replicate the same formula that Hiruzen and Danzo had used. Hashirama watched. You're doing that rather well, Naruto. Do you know what any of it means? A little. Hashirama smiled. Well, I bet I can teach you some cool new techniques to show your friends tomorrow. I have a book on it. Let me go get it right quick. Hashirama stood and walked off to the back room. Naruto continued to draw on it. He put the finishing touches on it. He looked up and smiled, certain that he copied the confetti bomb perfectly. He stood up and walked to the bedroom where Hashirama had gone. Dad, look what I did, he said as he opened the door, only to see Hashirama, his hand bleeding as it tried to catch the wire Kakuzu was trying to string behind his neck. Suddenly, the confetti bomb went off as Naruto stood there, his mouth agape. Hashirama looked to him. Naruto, run! He attempted to elbow Kakuzu in the ribs, which caused him to recoil slightly and tighten the wire. Naruto cried out. No, stop hurting daddy! Suddenly, from the boy's feet shot massive roots and vines, all going towards Kakuzu. The pressure in the room changed as Naruto's skin took on a pale color. Kakuzu was startled by this. This boy was stronger than the founding Hokage. Hashirama opened his eyes to look at Naruto and saw a set of Rene Sharingan in his eye sockets, each one glowing like the blood moon. Hashirama managed to pull a kunai out and went to cut the wire. Naruto's wooden vines began to flail violently. Let go of daddy, he screamed. Hashirama cut the wire and rolled away just as the wooden roots rushed in and stabbed through Kakuzu, pinning him to the wall. Kakuzu cried out and beat upon the wooden root, trying to free himself, but the finality of his wound had not yet set in. Slowly, his chakra, as well as his fluids, were sucked out, into the root, transferred to Naruto, who currently was forming small truth-seeking orbs around his head. Eventually, Kakuzu shrank to an empty sack of meat and bone, his blood and fluids completely absorbed by the vampiric wood that was holding him to the wall. Naruto blinked twice, and suddenly his demonic eyes faded back to normal. He fell to his knees. Hashirama rushed over and caught Naruto before he could pass out. I have you, Naruto, he shouted. I have you. At this time, Mito rushed in to check on the two and saw the sight. What happened? Hashirama held their unconscious son in his arms. Naruto saved me. Naruto sat on the steps of the academy with his friends, Donzo and Hiruzen. 
The sun was shining and there were only slight wisps in the skies hinting at clouds, but never really forming. Despite how beautiful the day was, it was rather cold. They were at the tail end of fall and the axis of the earth was turning their half of the hemisphere away from the sun. Naruto looked over at Hiruzen and Danzo, both of whom were now wearing official Konoha headbands. Naruto looked down at the one in his hands with a smile and placed it on his head, tying it off at the back. He looked to the others with a grin. We did it! We're finally ninja, Naruto said. And all on the same team, no less, Hiruzen said. Likely our fathers had a hand in this. I didn't expect to be on the same team as Sarutobi, Danzo said. Hiruzen looked up into the deep blue sky that grew lighter the closer to the horizon it was. The sun was at about the place it would have been at 10 a.m. They had made Genin not too long ago. Danzo then spoke. So, Genin, this new shinobi ranking system is strange. Back during the war, my father said that they didn't have this ranking and instead used rougher militaristic ranks such as lieutenant, private, colonel, and so on. Why did they change it? Because we're not at war anymore, Danzo. Danzo looked over at him. Not yet. My dad says it's going to change real soon. Suddenly, a voice spoke. Let's not speak of this right now. Let's continue to hope and pray that peace remains. The group turned to the voice and spoke in unison. Lord Tobirama! The silver flash of the leaf stood before them, every bit as imposing as ever. The legends about him, his fierceness and charisma, none of it had been a lie. Of course, Naruto already knew this. Tobirama was his uncle. But for Danzo and Hiruzen, it was as if a legend had stepped right out of a storybook for them. All the same, Tobirama didn't acknowledge this reaction, only stoking the flames of his own awesomeness. It's as if his stoic behavior was telling them that he knew he was cool and that it wasn't news to him. What are you doing here, uncle? Naruto asked. I'm here on a special request from your father. Naruto was confused a little. My father? Why? Tobirama attempted to mask a rolling of his eyes by rolling his neck over the palm of his hand. This wasn't technically a lie either, as all this time studying had given him a mad crick in his neck. He said that one day he'd hope to retire and pass on the role of Hokage to me. And to do that, he said I would need to pull my head out of my research and into personal matters within the village. That being said, he asked me personally to take some time and mentor the first generation of official shinobi. Donzo and Hiruzen were startled by this news. M mentor the first generation? Donzo asked. Hiruzen stumbled over his words, merely pointing inwardly. That means me? Tobirama cut his eyes over toward them. I don't see any other first generation shinobi around, do you? Hiruzen and Danzo looked at each other in awe, trying to process this. Naruto stood and hugged Tobirama. It's so nice to train with you, uncle. Tobirama carefully pried Naruto from his waist. We're not uncle and nephew when we're in a team, Naruto. At home, you can call me what you want, but on the field, I only answer to master, sensei, or my own name. Do you understand? Naruto nodded. Yes, sensei. Tobirama looked around. Now, does anyone have any questions before we begin? Hiruzen raised his hand. Tobirama would nod and allow his new pupil to ask. Why did we change our titles from military to the current three-step ranking of Genin, Chunin, and Jonin? I kinda meant situational questions, or moderately personal ones, Tobirama said, much to Hiruzen's disappointment and shame, though Tobirama elected to answer the question anyway. This was done in hopes of removing war from everyone's memories. However, we did it because warfare is changing. It's no longer just a bloodbath that you march straight into. It's becoming a war of espionage, skill, and deception. This means we must adapt our strategies. Squadrons are being replaced by three-man cells, generally lower ranking led by higher ranking. In eliminating the military structure, ladder climbing is also eliminated, which focuses individuals on the whole as opposed to glory seeking. The chain of command is decided not by titles per se, but by experience. A Chunin is a Chunin because they have more experience than a Genin, and a Jonin has more experience than a Chunin. This evens the playing field and makes everyone feel important. This structure is already being adopted by other shinobi villages, hinting that the way humanity wages war is also evolving. Gone are the days of straight battles, we've entered an age of guerrilla warfare. The point where the lines between civilian and military are blurred, and secrecy is everything. Experience matters more to this form of military than simple rank, which we hope will lead to more efficient leadership. Donzo pretended to understand what he said. Hiruzen seemed satisfied with the answer. Any other questions? Tobirama asked. Hiruzen raised his hand. What's your favorite color? Tobirama sighed as his face showed frustration. I don't know how I'm going to make it out of this, he thought to himself. Blue. Now let's get to training. He led them out to the nearby forests where he leaned against a tree trunk. So tell me. How long have you three known each other? Since the day we joined the academy together, Hiruzen spoke. 
And have you always been close? Tobirama asked. I would say so, Naruto stated. We've all hung out together since the day we met. We'd like to consider ourselves friends. Tobirama nodded. That's good. He held up a set of bells. I'm going to test you. Essentially, what I'll do is tie these bells around my belt. It's your job to take them. This is meant to teach you how it works on the battlefield. The lessons to be learned from this are simple. Dedication to the mission, teamwork, and self-sacrifice. You must be dedicated to the mission. The mission is the greater good, and any shinobi that doesn't choose the greater good over their own self-interests are scum. The second lesson to be learned is teamwork. When you can't accomplish a mission alone, you will require help, and to get help, it requires you to trust your friends to cover your weaknesses. That's easier said than done. Finally, I'm going to teach you self-sacrifice. As I said, dedication to the mission and dedication to your team will often leave you with a tough decision. That being said, I only have two bells. That means there are two chances to pass this test. Whoever fails to get a bell will fail the test and be removed from this team, permanently. The trio gasped at this in unison. Y you mean you'll send us back to the academy? Tobirama nodded. It's an important lesson to learn. On the battlefield, death is a constant. You have to be willing to sacrifice yourself or your friends for the village's sake. For the sake of progression, victory isn't free. There's always a price to be paid, and that price is paid in blood. This will simulate that. Essentially, the career of whoever fails to get a bell will die. And if you all fail to get a bell by 3 p.m., you all fail and your careers are dead. Even you, Naruto. Especially you, Naruto. I will personally see fit that whoever fails loses the rank of Genin and is removed from the Shinobi system. Failure to accept this test and failure to complete it results in this. By the end of the day, one or more of you will have to give up on your dreams of becoming a Shinobi. Am I clear? The boys gulped as it sank in. Tobirama smiled for the first time after seeing this. A cruel grin hinting that a sadistic nature had formed within the silver-haired legend during his time in the Warring States period. Something that shattered illusions of this warrior, and also made it seem as though he cared not for his own legendary status. He spoke through his grin, You will do whatever is necessary to take the bells, even if that includes killing me or butchering me beyond repair. If you do that, not only will the two who pass become shinobi to my replacement, but I'll even issue a written statement of recommendation to my brother to make you a future Hokage. He pulled out a kunai, but I highly doubt you'll get that far. Now, come at me and take these bells. Tobirama, just like that, disappeared in a flash of white lightning. Hiruzen, Danzo, and Naruto stood for a moment. Which of us will fail? Naruto asked. Danzo looked around silently, sure it would be him, but intent that it would not be so. Hiruzen looked to Naruto. We'll decide when we actually get the bells. For now, we need to focus on taking them so we don't all fail. Naruto nodded. The three of them then broke into the trees. We'll need a scout for our mentor, Hiruzen said. Naruto, you know more about Tobirama than any of us. Where would he go? What would he do? Naruto shook his head. I'm not sure. He's a walking enigma. I could try and plan based on his personality, but the thing is, is he's the smartest person I know and has a plan for everything. You won't find him unprepared. No doubt he's already come up with a plan that takes our family connection and plans around it in such a way that he knows exactly what I'll say or do before I do it. We need to act unexpected and move in unconventional ways. Here is a nodded. One unconventional way that he wouldn't expect us is if we pretended that we weren't working together. He's stronger than we are and I can already tell he thinks he's better. He is better, Donzo said. Here is an agreed to this and continued. True, but he also underestimates us a little. We're just kids after all. If we play off of that underestimation, we could probably take him by surprise. So I say we take an hour or so, chasing him down, embarrassing ourselves, and failing to work as a team. Then, at the end of it all, we simply take the bells when his guard is down. Donzo thought about it. A simple plan, but unexpected. I like it. Hiruzen looked to Naruto to gauge his reaction. Naruto smiled. All right, let's blow an hour and make fools of ourselves. And so they did. They sought Tobirama for quite some time, and Tobirama, hoping to nerf himself to the point that this test was actually possible for them, began making a few more mistakes to allow them to at least find him more easily. The point of this mission was hardly to take the bells, but to measure their determination and willingness to lay it all aside for their team's greater good. A day might come where one of them needed to die to save the others, and he wanted them to understand that sacrifice, to embrace it. That's what it meant to be a shinobi to give everything up for the greater good. If they couldn't learn this simple concept, then they weren't cut out to be shinobi anyway. And so he lowered the chances of his own escape and allowed them to catch up and actually have a chance at beating him. He would jump down to the ground and into a clearing where he would turn to face them. 
he would weave his hand signs and suddenly spew out a water release, water colliding wave. The wave would crash against the ground and push the trio away. Tobirama stood there. Perhaps he was pushing them too hard, but he wanted them to feel hopeless. The actions a shinobi took when the future was uncertain or when the cards were stacked against them spoke to their true character. He had no time for quitters. Is this truly the best Konoha has to offer? This village has no future with squibs like you. Naruto, Hiruzen, and Danzo all rose to their feet, soaked to the bone. Naruto began to weave hand signs as his father had showed him and utilized wood release great forest technique to strike out at Tobirama, who scoffed at the straightforwardness of this technique and Naruto's lack of subtlety. He simply utilized his fire release to burn it away before using his shadow clone technique to go on the offensive, striking out at the children. Hiruzen would attempt to block it while Danzo would avoid this by jumping back toward tree cover. Naruto simply got hit and knocked on his back. This shameful display continued on for about an hour, to the point that Tobirama was beginning to think that he should just call it off. It was getting harder and harder to nerf himself. He had lowered the bar so much that he thought any Genin should be able to stop by now, yet none of them did. It was getting sickening. You're a disgrace to this village and those who founded it. And this wasn't a joke statement meant to stoke their fire, his words were laden with venom. His stoic nature's best attempt to remain composed as his frustration spilled over. Just go home. If you can't even handle me when I'm letting you win, you're not worth any of my- Suddenly he felt something. He looked at the ground to find that a single tree root had risen silently from the ground and gripped the bells, pulling them off. Tobirama looked to the others. He risen began to laugh. I didn't think the plan would work so well. You really did underestimate us. Tobirama thought about it. They were faking their incompetence. They let me believe that they weren't capable of anything and then fed into that belief with their acting skills, only to take what they wanted when I let my guard down. His angry face had given way to confusion and finally to a satisfied smile. All right, fine. I'll admit when I'm beaten. You took the bells, but that doesn't change that you're going to have to choose one person to kick off the team. Someone's dream ends today. It's now time for the three of you to decide amongst yourselves who it will be. Naruto thought about it. I don't know if we can decide. Tobirama scoffed. Well, you're going to have to. It's non-negotiable. If none of you decide who to send home, I'll send you all home. You have five minutes. Go. Naruto looked at Danzo and Hiruzen. Who should we choose? Danzo looked at them. You guys are crazy if you think I've come this far just to lose it all. I need to make my father proud. Naruto looked at Hiruzen. Then it's between us. Hiruzen nodded. Naruto, you should continue to train under Tobirama. You're the son of the Hokage. You should serve as Lord First's legacy. Naruto shook his head. My dad already has Tajirama and even Tsunade to do that for him. Besides, I'm the son of the Hokage. I can train with dad anytime I want. And who says I need to be a shinobi to help the village? You can take the bell, Hiruzen. Time's up, Tobirama said. Which one of you will give up on your dreams of being a shinobi? Naruto stepped forward. I will. Suddenly, Hiruzen stepped in front of him. Me. Naruto looked at him. No, not you. Me. I'll give up my dream for the team. Hiruzen smiled. A nice gesture, but you could do more than me. I don't know why, but I sense a lot of potential. Naruto shook his head. No, I refuse this. If you're choosing to go home, then I'll simply go home too. Donzo can have this all to himself. He needs to please his father anyway. Donzo, hearing this, began to feel as if they were trying to show him up. They were proving their bravery by denying the bells. This made him feel like a coward. He clenched his fists and stepped forward. No, nah, -uh. no way. I don't need your charity. I'll be the one who goes home, Lord Tobirama. Hiruzen and Naruto shook their heads. Hiruzen spoke. I guess we'll all just go home. Tobirama's brow furrowed. You're all gonna go throw your dream away together. Why? Where's the logic? Hiruzen then spoke. I would rather all of us go down together than any one of us alone. And the mission? Tobirama asked. Hiruzen shrugged. It was completed. We got the bells. Now we'll all pay the price if we have to. Tobirama began to clap slowly. Your father's taught you well. Dedication to the mission is to be dedicated to the village. To be dedicated to the village is to be dedicated to your team. Dedication to your team is to be dedicated to the mission. These three things are all one thing, and yet you've all displayed your dedication to them. Maybe there's hope for Konoha yet. Fair. I'll take all three of you on as my pupils, so long as you all maintain that dedication. The boys all cheered, knowing that they passed the test with flying colors. As celebration, Tobirama would take them somewhere special to eat. After this, they would all begin making their way home. Hiruzen was awestruck by this lesson. It was so good. I'm going to have to remember this when I become a Jonin myself. All the while, Danzo thought on this. Dedication to the village, team, and mission all meant sacrifices, and sacrifices came in many shapes and sizes. 
So long as it was good for the village, no sacrifice was too big. This began to open Danzo's eyes to the meaning of what it was to be a shinobi. Naruto, on the other hand, was just too busy being grateful to remain on the same team as his friends. The three of them would be thick as thieves. He would be glad that he and his pals weren't separated. After this, the trio parted ways and began to make their way home. As Naruto entered his home, he called out to his parents. He searched for them, but couldn't find them. The lights were on, so it meant that there were people home, but where they were, he didn't know. He then noticed the mess. Papers on the ground, a mug had been smashed, and a table was flipped. Was the place ransacked? Oh no, mom, dad. He was worried, so he continued looking, but only found more destruction, as if someone was searching for something, or like there was a struggle. He kept searching around until he made it back towards the room that his father often used as an office. The door was closed, and there was whispering on the other side. Suddenly, Naruto became paranoid. Was it possible that someone had broken into his house and that they were searching through his father's belongings? Perhaps spies from another nation? More assassins? Naruto pulled eight shuriken from his pouch and wedged them between each of his fingers as he kicked the door open. He stepped through, ready to throw them. He saw his mother and father standing there, both of them shocked at Naruto's reaction. He saw them both there and looked around. His breathing slowed and he put his shuriken away. Are you guys okay? I saw the mess and was worried someone broke in. Mito nodded. We're fine, baby. Hashirama sighed and propped his head on his hands, both of which were supported by his elbows that sat on the table with a thud. Dad, what's wrong? Hashirama was silent. Mito began to walk toward Naruto. It's nothing. Go to the living room, Naruto. No, Hashirama said. Mito looked back. Hashirama pulled his head up. He's a shinobi now. It's time he knew. Hashirama sat back in his chair, looking rather tired, drained, or drunk. Perhaps all three. Negotiations with the other nations broke down. We're entering a war. A world war. Naruto was confused. A world war? Hashirama continued. Tensions have been rising steadily since Madara's mistreatment of the ambassadors from Iwagakure. From that point, it became common for nations to flaunt their power against each other. I was trying to calm them down, but it didn't work, and they accused me of attempting to start something by butting my head into the business of others. I fired back at them, and it was war. The one time I don't bring Tobirama with me to a summit, now we're going into a world war. Mito patted him on the back. I'm sure whatever happened wasn't your fault. It probably couldn't be helped. Hashirama shook his head. I need to call an emergency meeting with the other elders. Hashirama stood. Don't tell anyone, Naruto. I'll announce it when the time is right. Hashirama began to leave. He stopped at the door and looked back. I'm sorry. I wanted to keep you out of it. I didn't want you to experience war like I did. I failed you. Hashirama then exited the home. The day after, it was announced that war was coming, and so the forces of Konoha began to gather. Naruto waited for orders. Eventually, he was informed that he and his team would be called up for active duty. Iwagakure's forces were gathering on the northwestern side of the Land of Fire, coming together in Takigakure and Kusagakure. All the while, to the east, Kumo had entered the Land of Hot Water and was preparing for an invasion. The two greatest leaders in all of Konoha, Hashirama and Tobirama, were sent in both directions to face them. This meant that Hashirama went in the direction of Takigakure and Kusagakure, while Tobirama went towards Yugakure. And with him, Tobirama brought his team to help push back the forces of Kumo. During this time, they found themselves met with the Kinkaku Force, a special forces unit under the Raikage, and a direct counter to Tobirama's forces. Naruto, Hiruzen, and Danzo fought bravely against the Kinkaku Force, but their strength just wasn't up to snuff. The Kinkaku Force was one of the most elite military units in all of Kumo, and three Genin couldn't quite keep up with them. So for many months, they scraped by, just barely able to survive. Naruto, Hiruzen, and Danzo were in the trees. They were being chased by Shinobi of the village hidden in the clouds. They had just escaped battle with their lives, but they weren't quite safe yet. They knew they were being followed, and they could hear them getting closer. They were frantically attempting to escape, but eventually the voices quieted down. It seemed as though they might have escaped them. But suddenly, an arrow whizzed by Hiruzen. Ambush! He cried out. The three of them once again scrambled to escape. As they did, however, Danzo slipped from the tree branch he was on and fell to the ground, smashing his head into a stone. Hiruzen called out for him and jumped down. He tried to help him up. It was obvious that Danzo had a severe concussion, and he wasn't able to stand on his own. Hiruzen tried dragging him, though. More arrows whizzed by as Naruto cried out in the night for Tobirama to save them. He saw the arrows flying and knew that Danzo and Hiruzen were going to get killed. He saw a shinobi preparing to fire an arrow. Naruto threw a shuriken to stop him, but missed. The arrow flew. 
Naruto jumped down in front of his friends and took the bolt himself right in the chest. He stumbled a bit and threw another shuriken, killing the archer, but at that time a few more appeared and let fly their arrows. Two hit Naruto on the stomach, one on his left shoulder and one in his right leg. Naruto coughed blood into the night air, forming a red mist. Still, he held his arms out to protect his team, both of whom were screaming for him to escape. Naruto had made his decision though. The arrows were fired once again. Before they hit, however, Tobirama appeared like a flash, his blade deflecting each bolt. He suddenly threw a kunai into the group of them before seamlessly teleporting to it where he disemboweled them as if it were nothing. He stood there and wiped the blood from his face with his sleeve as he looked back at Naruto, who was still standing there, arms wide open. Was he even conscious anymore? Tobirama walked to him, seeing the grievous wounds. Naruto, he said, attempting to get his attention. Suddenly, Naruto's knees buckled and he hit the ground. He began falling back, but Tobirama caught him. Hiruzen looked to him. Naruto, please, please don't die. Tobirama growled. I'll be damned if I let him die here. He ripped out and gripped Hiruzen's arm. He used the flying Raijin Jutsu to teleport back to base camp, where he lifted Naruto up and brought him to the nearest medical tent to be treated. Hiruzen sat Donzo down in a chair where he was already having issues staying awake, but Hiruzen kept Donzo's eyes open. The medical nin began to work on the two of them. They removed the arrows from Naruto's body and began to staunch the bleeding as best they could. All the while, they attempted to help Donzo, using various treatments to keep his brain from swelling and crushing itself inside of his skull. They managed to successfully treat both boys, but it was obvious that they had hit their limit. Naruto and Donzo in a physical sense, and Hiruzen in an emotional one. As Donzo and Naruto were finally stabilizing, Tobirama took Hiruzen into a tent and sat him down at a table and dumped out a 1,000-piece puzzle in front of him, much to Hiruzen's surprise. Tobirama spoke, Do not talk. Do not stop. Do not leave this tent until you finish this puzzle. That's a direct order. Hiruzen was confused. He didn't understand why. His hands were shaking and his mind was frazzled. Tobirama pulled out four pieces. Start with these. They're the corners. Work your way in. He then left the room. Hiruzen began to work on the puzzle. Tobirama sighed in relief and began to make his way back to the medical tent where he sat down next to Naruto and looked him over. His wounds were deep and he had lost quite a bit of blood, but already they were healing. That must have been something caused by his status as the ten tails in human form. Suddenly, Naruto's eyes widened as he cried out, Daddy, don't! This startled Tobirama for a moment. Tobirama placed his hands on Naruto to calm him. Don't worry, you're safe. He laid Naruto back down. Are you feeling any better? Naruto sat there. What happened to me? Tobirama tried to speak vaguely. You were wounded, but you'll survive. Try not to remember it. Naruto lay back with a sigh of troubled relief. Is everyone else okay? Tobirama nodded. You saved their lives. You did good. Be proud of yourself. Naruto was silent for a moment, focusing on his breathing. He swallowed an excess of saliva and looked back at Tobirama. What now? Tobirama sat back in his chair and crossed his arms and legs. I'm sending you and your team back to Konoha to rest for the time being. You need time to heal, physically and mentally. Naruto shook his head. No, I'll be fine. I need to stay with you. Tobirama shook his head. No, this is a direct order. I'm giving you leave so you don't bring the team down. It'll also keep you alive longer. Don't worry, you will be coming back, but for now, I'm having you sent back to rest. Naruto acquiesced to his decision. From there, Naruto, Danzo, and Hiruzen were sent back to Konoha, together. Naruto would stumble into his house where his mother was waiting for him. Seeing his wounds, she would almost break down into tears, memories and horrors from the past becoming fresh in her mind. She would hug, coddle, and otherwise spoil Naruto to the best of her ability. Naruto spent most of his time just sleeping, or sleeping as best as he could. There were times when memories invaded his dreams, and that would startle him awake, but eventually he would calm back down and just go to sleep. After a few days of sleep, his wounds had healed to the point one couldn't even see the scars anymore. He would just sort of take it easy after that, going to visit and hang out with Hiruzen and Danzo. They would do all sorts of activities in hopes of remaining calm as the stress was ever present. Times were good and starting to get better, but on one particular night, Naruto came home and saw his mother sitting at the table, her appearance hinting to her distress. He walked over to her. Mom, are you okay? She looked at him with a smile and put her hands on his cheeks, kissing his forehead. Naruto, baby, we need to talk. Please, sit down. Naruto took a chair and sat down. He continued to look at her with concern as she spoke. Naruto, a few days ago, your father. She took a deep breath. Your father was leading the charge against the Tsuchikage's forces, and he was cut off from reinforcements. He was trapped, and Iwa threw everything they had at him. He fought so bravely. Naruto began shaking his head as tears filled his eyes. No, 
No, don't say it. No, she bit her lip. He was overwhelmed and killed. Naruto immediately stood from his chair. Mito looked up at him and saw the raw pain in him. Baby, are you gonna be okay? He looked at her with the wildest eyes and turned around and ran out the door. She stood and called out to him, Naruto! Naruto ran to the nearest quiet place he could, which was a small playground where he, Danzo, and Hiruzen used to play together. And there he fell on his knees, crying. He was just thinking of his father, how he wouldn't see him again, at least not in this life. How much pain he must have been in. He remembered how he dreamed of his father's death after he was wounded by the archers and had hoped it just to be a nightmare. But now it seemed less like a bad dream and more like remote viewing. Hiruzen would have been called by Mito, who would have explained it to him. Hiruzen would then make his way to the playground where Naruto would be found. He walked over to him. Naruto, are you okay? Naruto just gripped his own ribs as he sat on his knees, as if he were trying to give himself a hug. Hiruzen spoke. It's going to be okay, Naruto. Naruto grit his teeth. Easy for you to say. Your father's still alive. Hiruzen looked down. He is, but don't think that I don't know anything of what I'm talking about. I know what it's like to... You know this? Naruto cut him off. You know what this is like? You don't know anything, professor. You don't know a single damn thing. So save your words. Save them, he cried out as he turned around to stare at Hiruzen, his eyes a pair of glowing red Rene Sharingan, eyes burning with anger, hatred, sorrow, tears dripping from them in a steady stream. You don't know what I'm feeling. You don't know my pain. You don't know... Hiruzen stepped closer. We're a team, Naruto. We share this pain. Your father was like my own. I loved him as much as I love my own father. I would have died for him. Shut up, Naruto cried out. Suddenly, he fell forward, his right hand reaching out for the sand, gripping it tightly, finger marks being dragged through it as his body convulsed. What looked like spikes were forming along his spine. Slowly, they each grew out, taking a form like a porcupine's quill. Flowers began to bud from his hand, blooming quickly before dying and being replaced. The life cycle of the perennials being sped up to such a speed that it seemed almost impossible. Hiruzen took a step back. Naruto? Suddenly, Naruto's back arched as he faced up into the air. He let out a cry, his voice mixed with something monstrous as the ground below them shook. Roots began to extend from Naruto as his body itself began to turn to wood and expand in size. In the skies above, the moon suddenly turned a blood-red color. Hiruzen stepped back. It was just like in the stories. It was the Ten Tails. Tobirama sat by his desk. His head was low, propped on his arm as he read a letter. He put the paper down and sat back in his chair where he rubbed his face and looked up toward the tense, low-hanging ceiling. Hashirama, he said as he thought about it. Hashirama was the Hokage. He was the leader of the village. Without him, there was no village. Suddenly, someone rushed into his tent. Tobirama, sir! He looked over at the shinobi who stepped in. Yes. The shinobi's face was pale and sweaty. Sir, reports have come in that Konoha has come under attack. Tobirama sat forward. Attack? Who's responsible? Kumo? Iwa? The man shook his head. I don't know, sir. Tobirama stood and grabbed his armor and stepped out of the tent. I'm going back to Konoha. I'm going to take half of our forces. Keep my marked dagger close to you so I can get back as soon as I'm done. We're going to... He stopped as he noticed that all the other shinobi had their gazes turned toward the sky. Faces of shock and bewilderment as their unblinking eyes could not be torn away. The sounds of distant explosions had also seemingly died down. Tobirama followed their gaze and witnessed that the moon was crimson as it rose above the horizon. Upon its surface were the markings of Tomoe and rings. Tobirama had seen this only once before and knew exactly what it meant. As he gazed at the moon, its light intensified a bit and with it carried on the blood red light was a howl, a cry from a furious beast. Suddenly, the men around Tobirama fell to their knees and started crying. The sound of wailing and bawling could be heard from camp to camp. Tobirama stood there, the only one not crying. The only reason for this was that he too was feeling what this light was conveying. He had been feeling it all day, ever since he received the news. He witnessed so much pain and death that he was now numbed to the thoughts and feelings carried on the wind. Tobirama looked back at the messenger, who despite crying was to his credit still standing by his side. Tobirama spoke, Belay that last order. I'm going alone. If you don't hear from me in the next three days, assume I'm dead. Keep order in the chain of command. The shinobi, rubbing his eyes, nodded. Tobirama would disappear in a flash of white lightning. He would suddenly appear in the Hokage's office where Hashirama had stored his marked dagger. The room was dark, but a subtle red light filtered in through the closed blinds. 
He pulled them open and looked outside to see a massive figure of a wooden beast standing at the center of the village. It seemed to form a tailed beast bomb in its mouth before biting into it and firing it off instead as a beam of chakra that seemed to decimate a good portion of the village. Tobirama made his way out onto the roof. It was then that some Uchiha shinobi of the Konoha police force appeared. Lord Tobirama, one cried out. What are your orders? Shall we attempt to cast Genjutsu on the monster with our Mongekyo unit? Tobirama looked at the situation, taking a moment to push all personal feelings from his mind. I highly doubt that the Sharingan will work. If you haven't noticed, this beast possesses a Rinnegan. It may very well be immune to Genjutsu. Try gathering your main forces on the ground. The captain of the Uchiha police force approached him. Not possible, sir. Most citizen and shinobi alike are incapacitated by the pure sorrow reflecting from the moon. Only the Mangekyo unit remains capable of active duty. Tobirama acknowledged the man. Fine. Get a Mangekyo unit out here and have them prepared to utilize Susano to create a barrier around the beast to protect Konoha. I'm going to the Hokage's household. Yes, sir, the Uchiha said as they left. Tobirama then jumped from the roof of the Hokage's office down to the streets below. The sound of crying and wailing could be heard through every home. Shinobi and civilian alike were crying due to the emotion being channeled through the infinite Tsukiyomi that Naruto was casting. It was as if he were trying to make all people a part of him. He rushed into the Senju home toward Mito, who was standing on the deck outside the home, looking up. It's Naruto, isn't it? She asked. Tobirama's silence was the only answer he needed to give. Mito wiped tears from her eyes. He's in so much pain right now, she said. He's reflecting it off the moon, Tobirama said. We need to stop this before he hurts people. Mito looked back at Tobirama. Please, don't hurt him, Tobi. Tobirama stood there, his arms folded. Whether I hurt him or not is entirely up to Naruto. Either way, we can't let this tantrum destroy the village. I'm going to need your help. Mito stepped forward toward Tobirama. Please tell me you're going to try and reason with him. Tobirama nodded. I will try, but if I fail, we need to prepare for the worst case scenario, and that worst case will require you. Mito seemed shocked. Are you going to ask me to hurt my little boy? He stood there, silently for a moment. Are you going to ask me to hurt my son? She demanded a second time. Tobirama spoke. I'm going to ask you to do what's right for the village. When we first fought the Tentails, I told Hashirama to kill Naruto, but he didn't. He wanted to keep him. I made him promise that if Naruto ever became a threat, that he would not hesitate to do what was necessary to protect what we built together, and he vowed to me that he would. Now the responsibility of that vow falls to you, Mito. If we can't bring Naruto out of this, I'm going to need you to utilize sealing jutsu to seal him away. Can you do that? She shook her head. I, I don't know. Tobirama stepped forward, toward her, menacing look in his eye. Many people died to make this village a safe place for their children to grow up in. If we let the village be destroyed, then their sacrifice, Hashirama's sacrifice, will be in vain. But you're asking me to hurt my child, she shouted. I'm asking you to think of everyone else's children. What about Hiruzen and Donzo? Will you let them die because you can't tell Naruto no? You're the wife of the Hokage. You've got to act like it. The village needs us now more than ever, and I expect you to show up for it. You make it sound like I don't have a choice. Tobirama turned to leave. That's because you don't. If you don't get your ass out here and help me, then you're not going to be a member of this village anymore. Tobirama started jumping from building to building. In the distance, he saw a rainbow of seven colors, a wall of Susano standing there, blocking off the snarling tentails. They caught its attacks and sent it right back. They launched attacks of their own but most importantly, they were keeping a tight wall up to protect Konoha. Tobirama jumped to the shoulder of the police force's captain, Susano. I'm here. Keep a tight weave. He jumped down before the beast. The last time he faced this, he had done so with Hashirama's help. Now he was alone. It spoke louder than any words could. Despite an army of Susano standing behind him, he felt alone in this battle. In his hand was a kunai. He looked up into the Rinne Sharingan of the beast. Suddenly, Mito appeared by his side. She was wearing her shinobi gear that she had from the Warring States period. Tell me what to do, she said. Tobirama, without removing his gaze from Naruto, spoke. Utilize your adamantine chains to hold the beast in place. Coordinate with the Susano to ensure the beast is held down tightly. I'm going to use my sensory techniques to look for Naruto and see if I can't wake him up. He looked at her. And if I can't, you've got to seal it away. Mito took a deep breath and nodded. I'll buy you time, but you better try your hardest to wake Naruto up. If you fail me... There's nothing the Warring States period, the first Shinobi World War, no feeling they could give you that would be worse than what I will do. I lost Hashirama. I'm not losing Naruto too. Tobirama knew this was not the time to argue with such a headstrong person. 
Now was the time for action. Just hold it down. He stepped forward. Mito clasped her hands as strong adamantine chains wrapped around Naruto. She began barking orders to the Susano, telling them where her grip was weakest and telling them to latch onto it. As they did this, they slowly managed to drag the Tentail's legs out from under it. The beast fell to the ground. Tobirama approached it and started utilizing his sensory techniques to look for Naruto. The entire beast was packed with Naruto's chakra, so he had a hard time finding where the boy was. He decided that the best place to check would be where the beast's chakra was strongest, and so he began searching. When he found a particular place where the chakra seemed to be radiating out, he began to drill in until he entered the creature's body. By this time, however, it was beginning to break free from the control of the Susano and Mito, but that was okay. He was inside now. All they needed to do was ensure that it didn't destroy the village. Tobirama began to make his way deeper. He couldn't see where he was, so he lit the palm of his hand up with fire-style chakra nature and used it to illuminate the beast. Inside, he found sap dripping and heard the intense sound of wood creaking. As he walked, he couldn't help but feel that maybe he was being watched. He walked deeper into the creature, following the source of its chakra. He walked until he found it. There was Naruto, his appearance having returned to that from which they originally found him, skin pale as ash. He was resting inside of what appeared to be a large amber casing that extended from ceiling to floor. A glow emanated from inside of it, giving light to the surrounding area. Tobirama put his hand to the amber and looked at the boy who hid his face. Naruto. There wasn't much of a response. The area was filled with the sound of crying. In the pools of water around him, Tobirama could see memories of the past from the eyes of Naruto. Every moment involving Hashirama leading back to the largest pool of water, which was when he met Hashirama for the first time. Slowly, each pool was turning a deep red color before blacking out entirely. Tobirama shook his head. No, Naruto. Don't hide away your memories of Hashirama. He's still with you. Naruto's voice echoed inside the chamber, though the boy inside the amber didn't seem to move at all. Why did he have to die? Why did the sage have to die? Why did the people I love have to die? Tobirama stood there and looked into another reflecting pool and witnessed the Sage of Six Paths before Naruto falling to his knees grabbing his chest. The Sage let off a troubled smile before touching his hand in Naruto's cheek and closing his eyes. Tobirama saw the devastation of the Land of Elders and the sealing of the beast into a temple. One thousand years of darkness until the head of the Uchiha clan found him and forced him to remember his pain and anger. You remember your time before, Tobirama asked. Your time before you met us? The disembodied voice of Naruto spoke. I remember it all. I remember how happy we were. Then he died. And now my new dad died too. How long will it be until Mama dies? Until you? Hiruzen, Danzo, how many people will die? Tobirama put his hand on the shell once more. Death is natural. Everyone dies at some point, and when they do, they get to see those they lost again. There was silence for a brief time before Naruto spoke again. I never die. Huh? Tobirama questioned, hoping for more explanation. I can't die. Not for real. When I die, I become one with nature until I re-emerge. I never go to the afterlife. I'll never see dad again. For the first time, Naruto within the amber crystal looked up at Tobirama, his eyes full of tears. Why can't I die too? Tobirama began to beat on the crystal, his knuckles becoming more and more bloody until cracks in the shell formed. Then, suddenly, with one last swing of his hands, the shell cracked open and the sap within began to spill out, pulling Naruto with it. Naruto fell right into Tobirama's arms. The moment Naruto was pulled from the sap, there was a thud. Tobirama stood there, holding Naruto, letting him cry into his shoulder. Tobirama had never thought of what a lonely existence Naruto had led up until now. Everything in the world was temporary, save this world itself. And Naruto was a physical manifestation of this world. Since he had been created, he would always continue to exist. Forever. And that meant that when those he loved died, he would be separated from them forever. Naruto, you shouldn't want to die. I just want to see my dads again. Tobirama had no idea what to say. He simply moved to the side of the beast and drilled his way out. Stepping out, he noticed that the Ten Tails' form was already starting to decay. Mito rushed over to Naruto, removing her haori and wrapping it around him. The Susano standing sentinel over the village seemed to evaporate into stardust as their pilots hit the ground and ran to their leader. Mito took him up in her arms. He's so small. It's like he's a toddler again. What, 
What happened? Tobirama spoke. He's not a normal human, Mito. He's older than everyone in this village put together. His body takes the form of whatever his mind is feeling, and right now he's a lost and scared child. He just needs time to heal. In about a week, I could see him returning to his regular age, if not perhaps growing older. He's learned a hard lesson today, and I don't see him not growing from it. Naruto would be returned home, where he'd be doted upon by Mito for so long as she could. The two seemed unable to be comforted since the death of Hashirama. A hole had been opened in their hearts so deep that it seemed like it could never be closed. But time does heal all wounds, and just as Tobirama had predicted, Naruto eventually found balance in his emotions and returned to an older appearance, going so far as to appear almost 16 years old as opposed to being 12 like he had been before. In the days after the event known as the Wailing, there was an emergency meeting between Konoha's elders, and it was decided that Tobirama should be immediately upgraded to the rank of Hokage, his title being the second. In his acceptance speech that he made before all of Konoha, he acknowledged his brother as the only man he ever respected to hold the position, telling them that Hashirama led with his heart, which was something Tobirama could never truly hope to match. He vowed to do his best and then announced a commission to have the Hokage monument carved into the face of the mountain overlooking the village, telling them that so long as the mountain stood, the Hokage of Konoha would always watch over their people. This was a kind and beautiful gesture, and a proper expression of love from one brother to another. Besides that, the presence of Hashirama's face on the mountain brought peace and comfort to Naruto and Mito. This was further symbolic for Naruto. Being a force of nature, to see the face of the father who raised him become a part of nature was as important to him as if Hashirama's blood were flowing through his veins. After this, it became known far and wide that Konoha was capable of incredible feats, as the Wailing had shown them. At any point in time, Konoha could simply launch a psychological attack on the world from anywhere, and the world would be powerless to stop it. Because of this, Kumagakure was beginning to believe that it would be best to ally with Konoha instead of combating them, and the second Raikage invited Tobirama to a peace conference where the two planned to cement a deal that would see a relationship of mutual benefit formed. It was during this conference, however, that the Gold and Silver Brothers would appear and stage a coup to which Tobirama would barely escape with his life. He would end up in the Konoha Hospital for some time, recovering. This simple act managed to keep the First Shinobi World War going longer than needed. The simple fact was that the Gold and Silver Brothers hated Tobirama with a passion, ever since the beginning stages of the war, and now they were going to ensure that he was killed and his village destroyed for the times he embarrassed them on the battlefield. Naruto remembered going to the hospital and seeing Tobirama in such a condition. Mito had come as well to see him. She saw Naruto sit down by the bed and take Tobirama's hand. Are you going to leave me too, Sensei? Naruto didn't leave Tobirama's side the entire time he was asleep. The nurses tried to get him to go back home, but he would merely look at them with his Rene Sharingan active and vibe animosity toward them to get them to back off. Tobirama would wake up some days later to see Naruto sleeping on his arm. Had he been there this whole time? Tobirama thought about how scared Naruto must have been to lose him, considering his reaction to the death of Hashirama. And so, when Tobirama was finally better, he began to set out with his team back to the front lines. The sun had yet to rise, and they were in a time of twilight, just before the break of dawn. He stood there as Hiruzen and Danzo appeared with their things. Are we ready to go? He asked. Hiruzen nodded. We're just waiting for Naruto. Tobirama looked at him. Naruto? No, wait. I said we weren't bringing Naruto. Hiruzen seemed a little confused. Uh, are you sure? Because I told him we were leaving today. At about that time, Naruto was seen walking down the road toward them, a pack on his back. Tobirama tried to rub the frustrated expression from his face. Naruto stopped in front of them. I'm ready to go now. Tobirama stood straight, leaving his position leaning against the door. Naruto, it seems we had a breakdown of communication. You're not on this mission. Naruto seemed puzzled. W why not? I'm a part of this team, aren't I? Tobirama was silent. Naruto, I'm relieving you of duty. Naruto was quiet for a moment, his face displaying shock. What? Tobirama continued, After the death of Hashirama and my near-death experience, you just don't seem like you have the heart to be a shinobi. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. You can find... But I want to be a shinobi, Naruto said, cutting him off. Tobirama took a moment to figure out how best to articulate what he was saying. Listen, Naruto, it takes a hard person to be a shinobi. I just don't want to see you get hurt worse. 
Life on the battlefield is hard, and if we die, we can't have you acting out. You're brave and strong, but not everyone is cut out for the same job, and there are other ways you can help the village. Naruto refused this. Thank you, Sensei, but I refuse. This took Tobirama by surprise. You refuse? What if it's a direct order? Naruto repeated himself. I refuse. You know you'll get court-martialed, right? Naruto nodded. Yeah, but only if I'm a shinobi. You can't court-martial a regular citizen. Naruto took a moment to think. You're right. I am scared of losing you. Or losing Hiruzen and Danzo. But I know that if I'm there, I might be able to help save you. And think of it this way. Wouldn't it be better for me to turn into a ten-tailed monster on the battlefield instead of in Konoha? Tobirama shook his head. Losing control is bad no matter where you do it, because then you'll hurt friend as opposed to just the enemies. You would become a weapon that goes off anywhere. Naruto stood there. Please, Sensei, wasn't it you who taught me that loyalty to my friends and to my mission was loyalty to my village? I started this mission with you, and now I wish to finish it. So please, let me come along. Tobirama thought about it for a moment. He looked to Hiruzen, who had a begging look in his eyes. Tobirama sighed and then relented. Fine, but keep control of yourself. Together, the four of them made their way toward the front lines. Once they got there, they continued their mission. Intel gathering, espionage, and sabotage. For months this went on, but eventually word spread that the Hokage was here on the battlefield, and then suddenly the Gold and Silver Brothers and their unit, the Kinkaku Force, appeared to take Tobirama down. They surrounded a group of shinobi, of which only four remained. Koharu Utatane, Hamura Mitokado, Torifu Akamichi, and Kagami Uchiha. They used these four as bait to pull Tobirama and his team in, and the bait worked. They came to the rescue of this four-man team, but it became increasingly obvious that they were surrounded on all sides, and even a powerful warrior such as Tobirama himself could not expect to walk out of this alive. Tobirama and his team began to talk about what had to happen. One of us needs to stay behind as a decoy, Tobirama said. Danzo immediately clammed up and refused, but Hiruzen raised his hand, to which Danzo, suddenly sickened by his own cowardice, began to fight with Hiruzen over who would get to sacrifice themselves. In the end, Tobirama smiled at how they tried to take the spot, but shook his head. No, I'll be the one to do it. It's time to leave it to the next generation. Hiruzen, I'm naming you the third Hokage. Naruto reached out and grabbed Tobirama's shoulder. No, uncle, it's me. I'm doing it. Tobirama laughed. No, Naruto, I already called dibs. Naruto stood from their huddled position. Uncle Tobirama, I'm the one with the greatest chance of survival. I have regeneration. Not to mention, if I died, I would eventually reform. It's almost like I'm not dying at all, right? Tobirama shook his head. No, I'm more experienced than you. Your regeneration won't mean anything if you're overwhelmed on the spot. And still, even if you recoalesce into a new Ten Tails later on, you're still dying, and I don't want to tell your mother that. Naruto hugged Tobirama. Sensei, when we joined the team, you said that there would come a day where one of us needed to die for the team. A time when we had to set everything aside for the village, for the team, for the mission. This is that time. I refuse to lose you forever like I lost Papa. I'm doing it. He stood. Tobirama grabbed Naruto's shoulder. I'm not letting you go any- Suddenly, Tobirama was frozen in place. Naruto looked back at him with his Rene Sharingan. I'm sorry, uncle, but I can't let you do it. Tobirama fell back. I'm trusting you all to take care of him. He stepped up to the ledge of the crater where they were hiding. When you hear the fighting start, run. Hiruzen stood. Naruto, please. I'm coming with you. Danzo also stood. Me as well. Naruto smiled and looked back. This is a job only for me. Hiruzen shook his head. No. When we took Tobirama Sensei's test, we all decided it would be better to fall together than to survive alone. I can't let you go alone. Naruto turned back. And I can't let you go with me. Please, don't make me cast you under Genjutsu too. Torifu raised his hand and grabbed Hiruzen's sleeve. Let him go, Sarutobi. He's doing this for us. Tears welled up in Hiruzen's eyes as he embraced Naruto. You better come back. Swear it. Swear you'll come back to us. Naruto smiled solemnly. I swear it, Hiruzen. I swear I'll come back. And with that, he rushed out into the night. Torifu and Kagami were working on lifting Tobirama. Come on, we need to get out of here, Kagami shouted. Hiruzen walked over and helped pick Tobirama up. All the while, Naruto was running through the trees. He saw the Kinkaku force waiting for him below. He jumped into the air, his silhouette visible only against the stars of the night sky. He weaved hand sides. Wood release, secret technique, nativity of a world of trees. He would smash the ground with his hand, causing trees to sprout up and strike or kill anyone in the way. 
Many members of the Kinkaku force fell. Naruto then activated his Rene Sharingan and used them to locate all the others. When he saw Ginkaku, he raised his hand and channeled the Diva Path from it to push him away. But Kinkaku came out of nowhere to strike Naruto, Basho Sen in hand. With a swipe of his fan, he launched Fire Nature Chakra at Naruto, causing the wood he had formed to catch fire. Naruto and Kinkaku began to duel in the flames. I wasn't hoping for a runt to kill. I was hoping for Tobirama. Naruto pointed his finger. Tobirama's too good for you. I'm here in his place. Kinkaku continued to step forward as the trees burned behind him. I thought you looked familiar. You're that kid who was with Tobirama all those years ago. Do your arrow wounds still hurt? No, let's fix that. He snapped his fingers. Suddenly, arrow bolts were fired out of nowhere. Naruto took three to the back. He fell to his knees, coughing. As he knelt there, he looked up at Kinkaku. Is that the best you've got? Suddenly, Naruto finished weaving hidden hand signs, and he formed wooden spikes that he proceeded to fire at his enemies. Kinkaku blasted them away with wind style from his Bashosen. Naruto pulled the arrows from his back using binds. This caused him pain, but he slowly let them regenerate. Suddenly, Kinkaku was on him again. Ginkaku was attempting to swing Shichi Saiken at Naruto, striking him with the flat, sending him rolling. The two of them stood next to each other. Regardless of if you're Tobirama or not, we're going to kill you. I hope your death bothers Tobirama. The two men came at Naruto. He attempted to defend himself by summoning tree roots at his feet, which grew larger in volume, waving about like the arms of an octopus. Ginkaku was knocked back, but Ginkaku made it through. He swung his blade at Naruto, who pulled his own sword and managed to block and knock it back. Suddenly, Kinkaku summoned the Kokinjo and wrapped it around Naruto's neck, hauling him up into the air, hanging him like a criminal at the gallows. Naruto struggled as Ginkaku and Kinkaku laughed at him. First the founding Hokage, next the second Hokage. We won't stop until there's nothing left of Konoha. Naruto grunted. Never say my father's name. Suddenly, from the tree he was hanging from, a pure, sharp branch sprouted with such force that it pierced clean through Ginkaku. Ginkaku cried out as blood ran from the wound. Ginkaku caught him. Naruto managed to weasel his way out of the bindings. He hit the ground and prepared for more, but was suddenly struck by the Shichi Saiken. You dare kill my brother? I'll murder you! Naruto went rolling. His head was bleeding. As he tried to stand, his legs went out from under him. He sat there as Ginkaku pulled at a kunai. Let's see you regenerate when you have no heart. Naruto would use his wood release to form a large wooden fence between himself and Kinkaku. A fence that began breaking down as Kinkaku beat into it more. Naruto managed to stand and regain his balance. Kinkaku pushed through, wielding both the Shichisaiken and a kunai. Naruto, holding his weapon, was ready for round two. Naruto began to use wood release cutting technique again, but Kinkaku caught them all with his blade. You like wood so much? Have some more then. He would lift Naruto up and push him against a tree. Naruto didn't notice it at first, but the blood trickling down his chest told him all he needed to know. He looked down and noticed that he had been impaled upon it. He managed to pull himself off with some effort, but suddenly Kinkaku came running and punched him straight in the stomach, before carrying him along with the punch through three larger trees. He then smashed Naruto into the ground. By the time this attack was over, there was a hole in Naruto's stomach all the way through. Kinkaku pulled his arm out from the gaping wound and crawled on top of Naruto and began to choke him out. Naruto grabbed the hand, trying to stop him, and in that moment, Naruto knew he would die. He saw his entire life flash before his eyes. From his time with Hagoromo to the last moments he spent with Tobirama, his Rene Sharingan widened as suddenly he formed a truth-seeking orb in his hand and pressed it into the chest of Kinkaku. The orb detonated spectacularly, blowing Kenkaku through the air, causing his shattered body to land in a nearby river, only to float away to destruction. Naruto himself had been launched back by the blast's kickback. Lifting his arm, he realized that the hand he had used to launch the attack had been completely blown off. Naruto couldn't move. He simply lay there in silence as he looked up at the stars, seeing the first touches of orange brightening the day. The sun was making its appearance again. Naruto smiled a little and laughed before a coughing fit nearly caused him to pass out. He was bleeding badly. Missing an arm, a hole in his chest, and an even bigger hole in his stomach. He couldn't feel his legs and his spinal cord had been cut. To be honest though, Naruto couldn't feel much. Only a sensation of overwhelming cold. The upper part of his body shivered violently. He wondered if this is what Hashirama and the sage felt. He lay his head back. Dad. He said as his eyes seemed to dim. Are you proud of me, Dad? He felt two hands grasp his left hand and another pair grabbing his right. His eyes drifted over to the one holding his right. He saw Hashirama there. 
and on the left he saw Hagoromo. Can I come and stay with you guys for a while? Mito was at home folding some laundry and doing her daily duties. She was currently washing Naruto's favorite outfit, the thing he tended to wear every night it seemed. She smiled as she thought about it. She was unaware that Tobirama was standing outside of her house. He held in his hand a forehead protector. Naruto's forehead protector. They managed to find him later on, and when they did, they were surprised to find that he had single-handedly dealt with the Kinkaku force. Only a few archers had survived. Most amazingly, Ginkaku and Kinkaku had been found dead, one impaled on a tree and the other at the bottom of a waterfall wedged between the rocks. But this was hardly good news to Tobirama. Naruto's body had been so broken by the battle. Tobirama had not cried in the years since the death of Itama, not until he saw Naruto. He knew that it was because he allowed Naruto to come with him in the first place that he was now dead. How could he ever forgive himself? By the time he had worked up the nerve to knock on the door, two hours had passed. As he went to knock though, the door opened. Mito was getting ready to head to the market it seemed. Oh, hello Tobirama, she said with a smile on her face. I'm glad to see you're back in the village. Where's Naruto? Tobirama swallowed as he felt his heart skip a beat, answering only with one that was twice as hard thereafter. He gripped the headband. She saw it and the way he looked down at it. Don't say it she said as tears started to form in her eyes. He was, Tobirama started to say, he was so brave. Mito collapsed down to her knees. No, Naruto. Time marched forward. Mito never really recovered from this. She only ever seemed to find happiness again when meeting a young Uzumaki girl, a refugee from the downfall of the Uzumaki, Kushina. She doted upon that girl as if she had always been her mother but perhaps that was just the mother in her wishing to see Naruto again. Tobirama continued on as the second Hokage for a good time, until the end of the Second Shinobi World War, where he passed the title down to Hiruzen. All the while, Hiruzen had trained three pupils, one of which, named Jiraiya, had heard a prophecy that the world would be led to peace by a child of prophecy. He would go on to train many, but there was only one that he thought could fulfill the prophecy, Minato. Minato would later replace Hiruzen as Hokage as the Third Shinobi World War came to a close. He would eventually marry Kushina and the two would become pregnant. And on October 10th, a child would come screaming into existence. A familiar child. A child with a pair of Rene Sharingan eyes. And that's the end of the story for now. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was sort of a downer there at the end, but something very important to remember is that a hero isn't a hero because he does things without consequence. Sometimes the best stories and the best heroes are heroes who sacrifice themselves for others. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. But as you can tell, the story isn't over yet for Naruto, and it's very possible that I could make a sequel series. But of course, for me to make such a series, I need to see that you guys are interested in it. If you are, please leave a comment down below and tell us, and like the video. Show your friends this series and see if they like it as well. If the video does well, then maybe I'll make it for you. Until then, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.